Yeah. 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 First off, thank you very much, everybody, for showing up. And uh, even more so, there we go, hold on. There we go. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And even more so, we want to thank Thumbtack and Jason and all the individuals at Thumbtack that made this happen because uh, it was a lot of work to make each and every single one of these events. Yeah? Hello. Okay. So we'll do this all over again. Uh, thank you everybody for showing up today and a special thanks absolutely for to Thumbtack for putting this on and everybody involved in the food and the logistics. I mean, it, it's, it's not a small task. Uh, it, handling the AV for us, uh, the security, everything. Um, and thanks to Jason for, for getting this all going for us. Um, we're excited to, after uh, having a little bit of a break, to kick off another MacBrain meetup. Um, we would absolutely love it if you could go to our website and host an event. We have a hosting tab there. Please, 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 uh, you know, throw your info in there, even if it's just a maybe. Uh, Jason, myself, or, or Stephanie will reach out and we'll, we'll, we'll figure out if we can make something work. What we're trying to do is we want to start uh, releasing multiple months at a time and we're really trying to plan ahead. So we're really close to figuring out June, July, August, our next few events. Um, but we're, we want to try and make this a little bit more cohesive and, and regular every single month. Uh, but we can't do that without hosts. Uh, that's definitely what's held us up the last few months. So please, please, please. And also with that speaking, if you have something really cool that you're working on that you want to present, even if you've never presented before, this is the perfect audience to do it with. You know, really nice. No one's been heckled off this stage except for maybe me once or twice. So please, please, please. Um, and with that, let's kick over to... Jason is going to be talking on behalf of Thumbtack. Hey guys, so uh, first I do want to give a super shout out to our events manager, Jen, wherever she is. Thank you so much for putting this on. You are amazing. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I also want to give a huge shout out to our culinary team. They make delicious meals for us, you know, on the regular. And the meal they did tonight was uh, just superb for this amount of people plus our staff. So huge shout out to the culinary team wherever they have gone. And uh, for some of those people who don't know what Thumbtack is, I'm going to describe to you guys and let you guys know uh, what Thumbtack is and why it's just a great place to be, a great place to work, and a great place to get to get to done. And one reason why I decided to come be the, uh, the IT guy over here. So. Thumbtack is an online service that connects customers with skilled professionals to get things done. More than uh, 230,000 professionals in uh, 1,100 unique categories ranging from handymen uh, to housekeepers to tutors, photographers, wedding planners, and even more use Thumbtack to uh, connect with millions of customers. Collectively, uh, they generate more than $1 billion annually uh, of business across all 50 states. At once, we're giving customers a super simple way to complete over 5 million projects each year. Uh, we were founded in 2009 by our CEO, Marco, I, Michael Z. I'm going to butcher his last name so I can't do that. Uh, Jonathan Swatson and Sandra Daniels. And we are headquartered, headquartered, of course, here in San Francisco. And we have our customer success center out in Salt Lake City. So we're set to double in size in the company this year. So if anybody knows of any talented people as far as engineers, products, designers, analytics people. We will gladly take them on board to go on this wild ride that we're on right now. This is an amazing time to be at Thumbtack. So thank you guys and uh, I'm super stoked to have everybody here. Enjoy.
All right, and also, and I forgot this, but I want to do a special thanks out to uh, Mike Dodge, who did a pre-interview. Go check it out. It's on uh, our Facebook page. Uh, grabbing random people, talking about imaging, going back and forth. This is something we're going to see if we can't get going on a regular basis, a nice little cohesive streaming pre-event thing. Um, without further ado, let's have Nick come up and start showing off his imaging workflows. Hi. So anybody who's ever seen me present before pretty much knows how this goes. I start out sounding really smart and cool, and then I proceed to talk faster, get a little bit more crazy. My pitch goes up a little bit, and everything just falls apart at that point. So bear with me, please. At Facebook, is this better? Yeah. OK, great. See, it already went downhill. So <laughs> this is all about, as you can read here, our process of automating our image creation at Facebook. And this is the wizard version. When I started writing this presentation, I started laying out this grand plan of how we do everything, all these details, our automation procedures, our setup, our code samples, everything. I had this presentation. It was awesome. It was 120 slides. It was three slides a minute. That's not going to work. So this is the version where I sort of hand wave some of the magic that happens. And we'll, we'll just gloss over the implementation details in favor of the bigger picture. Uh, if you want to know more about some of the pieces that we're going to talk about, please come talk to me. Come find me. Um, or you know, look at our GitHub, and I'll talk about that later. And if you have any problems, yell at Mike Dodge, because he's the owner of it. <laughs> All right, let's get this out of the way. Imaging's dead. All right? Right, imaging's just dead. So this is a talk about necromancy. The reason imaging is dead is because for the first time, Apple has actually provided a supported mechanism for us to roll out new Macs in a way that they actually officially sanction. Back you know, 10 years ago, 2006, it was kind of the Wild West when it came to actually deploying Macs at, you know, in a larger group. You asked your Apple rep, hey, so I got to get 200 of these going. What do I do? Right? So now we have this tool, DEP, and you know, choose your own MDM, and you can get a machine out of the box, turned on, it has all stuff it needs. It enrolls in the MDM automatically, it downloads all the software, it configures all your stuff, it's just done, it works, it's great. And this is a super handy procedure that I think most people are really gonna benefit from. And I will say that I think for most people, this is the way to go. So let's look at this workflow a little bit. The first time you turn your machine on, right? You got to get your software installed. OK, let's go ahead and install Microsoft Office. <laughs> right? It takes forever, because Microsoft Office is huge. All right, let's also install Firefox, Chrome, Photoshop, 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 configurations. Now let's run the Apple updates. Apple updates, Apple updates, Apple updates, Apple updates. Now you have to reboot, all right? So, that first experience out of the box, yeah, you get all that stuff done, but you spend a lot of time sitting there watching this machine get itself set up. So it's super adaptable and super flexible, and that's great. Modular deployment is really important. And I think for many, if not most people, it is the way to go. And I would recommend it for most. But it's not very fast. It's kind of a slow process, right? You sit there watching this machine turn on, set up, go through all this stuff. And then you do that again for 50 more machines. Then you do that again for all of your machines. When you have to do a whole bunch of them in a row, a whole bunch of them at once, this becomes a really lengthy process. It becomes really difficult to manage. So the overall context to this whole talk is that right now, we are valuing speed above all else. The speed of deployment is our, excuse me, is our number one concern. So what's a fast solution? Well, imaging is fast. Imaging's dead, but it's really fast at being dead. So we want to find a way to sort of get the best of both worlds. We want, look at all the pros of imaging, right? You start with your base image. You've got your base OS. You've got your Apple updates already loaded in, right? You want to add in your, your first boot config, your software deployment like Monkey or whatever, or you can you know, throw your quick add in there for Casper. And it's great. You have an image that has your stuff already there. It just loads up on first boot. You're good to go. 
Uh, there's a presentation I love to refer to that I still think is one of my, one of my all-time favorites. Uh, Steve Yeroff did a great presentation at PSU Mac 2014 called Going Mad about Monkey Auto Package and Deploy Studio, like the sort of the golden triangle of, of thin provisioning and thin imaging. You add auto DMG to that mix, and you kind of have the, the very foundation of thin provisioning of Macs, and it works out great. And in this kind of scenario, right, your base image rarely changes. Apple releases major system updates only, you know, every once every, you know, a couple times a year, right? You've only got 10.1, 10.11.2, 10.11.3, 2, et cetera. So you don't have to change this very often. But now let's talk about the downsides to imaging. If all you do in your workflow is you just preload the base image with just the OS and the updates, you've only really saved a little bit of time relative to the overall deployment process. You still have to spend all that time on your first boot installing and downloading all your software. So you've shaved off a few minutes here, but you still have to go through all this stuff. At least it's not interactive, but really we've only shifted the problem a little bit. We haven't really solved the issue. And if you've got images that you're, that you're using and you've got multiple sites around the world where you need to be able to support imaging, you've got to transfer these big honking six to eight to 10 gigabyte images across the world. That gets expensive really, really fast, especially if you've got sites that don't have unlimited bandwidth. So we really want speed and we don't want to lose flexibility. We want to be able, the ability to have fast imaging and dynamic imaging. So, the ideal scenario here is that we want all the stuff, as much as it can be done, already in the image. Image transfer is fast. Block restores through Deploy Studio or Net Restore or whatever is a fast process. So the more that we can put in here, the better off we're going to be. We also don't want to spend lots of time transferring this stuff around the world, right? So if I generate you know, a nice big 10 gigabyte image, if I have to transfer that to 60 plus imaging sites worldwide, it's a nightmare, okay? Just, just think, if you've got imaging servers in every time zone, like Facebook does, right? So that means at any given time, I'm transferring 10 gigabytes to an offsite. That site may have limited bandwidth, and so if I'm doing this at 10 a.m. local time here, that's, two, that's, two, that's, that's uh, noon in Sydney, Australia. That's, you know, that's the middle of the day for Singapore. That means if I'm using up all of their bandwidth during the day, their productivity is impacted because I'm doing a transfer. If I do it late at night for me, that's morning for somebody else. So we could try setting up some sort of strange sync process where we only do it at 10 p.m. local time or after midnight local time, but that means you're basically transferring stuff 24 seven nonstop. This just scales out of control rapidly. Just people just start crying, you start getting tickets, you get in trouble, your boss yells at you. It just, you don't wanna go there, I've been there. So what we need to do is we want to find a way where we can incorporate this OS and Apple updates. We want to try and preload as much of the software as possible from, you know, in our case, we use Monkey for this. We want to try and preload all of our config data, all of our caches. We want to get all of our first boot actions to happen so that when the machine boots up after imaging for the first time, it runs all the stuff it needs to. And we want to do all this dynamically. I don't want to have to do this manually. I love automating things. Anybody who's ever talked to me knows I love automation. Automation's wonderful. I hate having to use the mouse. I used the mouse once and I broke out in hives. It was terrible. And so ideally, we really want this to work with any tool, right? We want this to be completely tool agnostic. I don't want to be dependent upon the behavior of Deploy Studio, the behavior of Casper, the behavior of Imager, or NetRestore, or FileWave Lightning, or any other tools out there. I don't want to depend on them. I want to do things my way. Doesn't sound so hard, right? <laughs> so this is where I introduce, this is the, the kind of the hand-waving magic part, right? This is where I introduce our scripts. This is now live. This is public, it's live, and I actually documented it, which is amazing. Um, so this is the script that we use called AutoDMG Cache Builder. I'm open to suggestions for new names. If somebody has a cool, sexy name they want to use, let me know. Um, and this kind of solves all of our problems for us. You get your base image, Monkey tells you what needs to be installed, and we get to add any of our organization-specific stuff, all of our customizations that get to go in there. So we get the base OS and Apple updates, AutoDMG lets you use templates, which means you can just add any list of arbitrary packages you want to be put into the image. And you can do, and these templates are just plists, and we're all familiar with plists and all the joys and wonders of angle brackets everywhere, everywhere. Um, and it's entirely scriptable, right? This can work entirely through the command line, doesn't require any GUI interaction, so I can automate this whole process of automating the process. I love doing that. So, wizard time. 
All right. You start with your base. You start with your basic operating system. You ask Monkey, what should be installed on every machine? What's the list of things I want on every machine? We take all those things that it says I need and we put them into a local cache. If it's a simple package, we just go ahead and add it to the image. If it's a complex package, we add it to the exceptions folder. And the definition of e exceptions and complex packages is that when you're putting something into an image, what you're really doing is you're telling the installer to run the install process on a target disk image. It still is going to execute any scripts that might be in the package. And as I'm sure everybody here has come to know and love, there are a lot of really shitty packages out there that are just not well crafted. They run scripts that do all kinds of bananas things that make a lot of assumptions that, okay, the vendor assumes you have only ever done this by double clicking on the package icon on the desktop with a user logged in. That's not really the case for enterprise deployment. Most people here are probably familiar with the fact that we have to really struggle to make sure the stuff that we install works in a context where there's no user present. We want to be able to get this stuff deployed in an enterprise manner. And so if you're installing packages that are running these complex scripts, those are actually running on the host. They're not running on the image. The image is not booted. The image isn't the live computer. So we really can't trust any package that behaves in this way. We have to be able to suppress them later. Now, if you're using Monkey, there's an easy way to do that. When Monkey first runs, it downloads all the packages it needs into the local cache and then installs them. So all the things that we don't want to put into the image right now, put into the image right now, we just go ahead and put those in the cache folder instead. We preload the Monkey cache so that Monkey doesn't have to bootstrap them. Uh, it doesn't have to download them during bootstrapping phase. And so this is actually a huge time saver right there. We package up all of the cache ahead of time. We drop it on the image. When it's booted, there's no real bandwidth usage required. So that already saves us some time right there. That's already a win. So you just add whatever you want to the template, right? We need to be able to make sure that we can add arbitrary packages. I'm adding a lot of organization-specific things. I'm also adding some things that maybe I don't have in Monkey. Maybe I don't want to tell every machine, you must install Office. But I want it to be there in case the user wants it. They can always remove it later if they want, but I want to make sure it's preloaded because this is a big install. So when I first started at Facebook, the onboarding process, right? They get 30 of us in a room together, we all sit down. They give us the big talk about how you should never do anything that might end up as a headline on TechCrunch, or you'll get fired. And then they give us all of our new devices. And <clears throat> all 30 of us get a nice new phone and a nice shiny laptop. This is cool. Then all 30 of us turn on our laptops and turn on our phones. And you can kind of see where this is going. After about 10 minutes, you can already tell Wi-Fi access and there's a little bit spotty. You've got 30 people. You've got minimum 60 devices. Everybody also brings their own phone that they have. So you've got minimum a lot more than 60 devices. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, and so the Wi-Fi starts getting a little bit wonky. Now imagine if that first day I'm in this room, Wi-Fi is already falling apart. 30 other people are all trying to download Microsoft Office at the same time, right? That's a 1.6 gigabyte package install straight from Microsoft. That's, you know, you, let's say you want to add Photoshop to the mix. Hello? <laughs> let's say you want to add Photoshop to the mix, right? That's another two gigs. You want to add anything else? Like all this, imagine you're in a room with 30 people with one Wi Fi access point and you're trying to download five gigabytes or more of stuff on that first time. It's not going to work. The experience is going to be terrible for everybody. Now, you could kind of address this by, designing your Wi-Fi in a more thorough way. You could make a special room that's meant to handle this kind of load. But at that point, you're designing a workflow around a limitation you've created for yourself. You're solving the wrong problem at that point. And infrastructure changes, as we all know, are significantly more difficult to get done than workflow changes to the process for which you deploy things. So I want to avoid that problem completely. I don't want users to have to engage in these downloads the first time they get a machine. This should already be done. When they get their machine, this should already be accomplished for them. They shouldn't have to do it for me. They shouldn't have to do it for themselves. And also, I also don't want someone else to do all this ahead of time, because at that point, I'm just having a field tech go through the same 40-minute download process. Maybe I'm saving them some time, and ultimately, in the future. But at still, at some point, somebody has to download that stuff. I don't want that to happen. I want to automate it. So in addition, right, we got more things we want to put in there. The monkey icon cache, same thing with self-service. All those icons get cached locally when you run self-service the first time, when you run monkey the first time. There's no reason to download that on the first boot. Let's get all those icons in there. Let's preload them into the image. Okay, We run Chef, and Chef caches all the cookbooks locally. Let's get all that into the image. 
Let's get our file vault keychains in there. Let's get the package to suppress the iCloud prompts, the setup assistant, the diagnostics window. Uh, let's preload the TCC database so that we can already tell our tools to be able to have access to uh, the accessibility interfaces, location services, things like that. We want to preload all that stuff in there. We want to do as little work after as possible. And so once we get all these packages built, we get all this stuff automated, you run the script. And what does it do? Magic. It produces you an image. This image is going to have all your stuff on it. It's going to have all your caches preloaded. It's going to have your first boot triggers activated. And it's good to go. You deploy it onto a machine, and you're great. That's the first part, right? So we have the image ready. Now, how do we actually make this work for 60 imaging servers worldwide? I've already said, I don't want to sit there transferring images across the world all day. When you build an image like this, you get, what, a 10, 12, 20 gigabyte image, depending on what you preload in there, right? Transferring that much stuff across the world all the time, if I want to make it worthwhile, they have to have a new image every, every night, every week, every month. The more I delay the process, the less benefit I get from imaging. So the only way to make this useful is if every single server can do this every single time. So on a previous Mac rain, I think it was two years ago, um, uh, one of our team members gave a talk about how Facebook does imaging at scale. And we gave a talk about how Deploy Studio uh, was our solution. Well, we had a local Deploy Studio server that was our master. And then we had major servers in each region, you know, sing, you know India, and China, and Europe that would sync as a replica to this master server. And then each office from there would contain a replica point to their region. So we made a change on our master server. And slowly but surely, it cascaded its way out. That was like 30 seconds in sketch. <laughs> so this is a great idea. And it worked really well. The problem is, again, time zones, right? Time zones kind of become a problem here. So if I landed a change to the imaging workflow, at 10 AM, okay, that means, sure, it'll sync to the local server. And then the DS nightly sync will kick in and, and propagate out to all the different ones across the world. But depending on the time of day, if I land that at 10 AM, it might already be past the time which a server in Sydney, Australia, or Singapore, or India would have done its nightly sync. It'll be behind for another 24 hours. And sometimes this causes a break. Sometimes that means a change that I made didn't actually get across the world in time. It's like DNS changes, right? It just takes time to make, that, to make that happen. Sometimes that causes you grief. And when imaging breaks, you get a lot of grief. And I don't like getting grief. So yeah, I, I, I ended up looking like this a whole lot when, when this kept happening. When I would make a change, and then I'd get a call at 3 in the morning from India saying, uh, our, our imaging's broken. Uh, can, can you help? It's 3 in the morning. Does this have to happen now? I got to do like 40 computers by tomorrow. OK. So you know this process just stops being useful after a certain point. When you scale across that big, it's just too slow. So part two of the wizard version, right? So rather than transfer this image across the world, let's have each server build this on its own. Because all we need is a copy of the OS. All we need is the standard monkey updates the Apple updates, OK? All this together is the only bandwidth I really need to transfer. One time, a couple times a year, I give them the OS install. That's a six gigabyte transfer you know, three or four times a year. Monkey updates is probably not more than 300 megabytes a week. You know, Who knows, depending on how much you do. And then the Apple updates, I ballpark this at, what, 150 megabytes a week? Does that seem reasonable to people for Apple software updates, right? Give or take. I mean, not including the voice updates. So now. The actual bandwidth transfer to all these 60 plus imaging servers worldwide is really low. They don't actually have that much work to do. Instead, they have all the tools they need to build this image locally. All you need is a server. You, know, you, need, you need a NetBoot server, right? And if you, you want to use server.app, you've got caching. Why not? Um, you need the OS installer, which we covered. You need a copy of auto DMG installed, monkey. And then after all that, this is what you get. You get a fully updated image. Software is preloaded. There's minimal activity that has to happen post-restore. This will work with any disk restore tool, disk utility, file wave lightning, net restore, uh, you know, deploy studio, imager, all those things, whatever you want. And this is built individually on every single server. 
So each server becomes its own self-sufficient image construction. And this happens every single night. So previously, our imaging from, from the first turning on of NetBoot to the first time a user logged in was about 24 minutes. And that was from, you know, that's on the fast Mac pros, you know, with a wired connection straight to the core, so they get all the stuff right away. Now, when you preload all that into the image, nine minutes. We can image a machine in nine minutes. And you know, we are right now in the height of intern season. We have people coming on campus who I've never seen before, and there's just crowds of them, and they just come like locusts and steal all the food, and the snack bar is empty, and I have to walk like three floors to get fed. This is terrible. But they all need a computer. They all need a computer, and they all need a phone. And so when we have to do 120 computers a week minimum, we have to do 200 a week minimum, depending on you know, the height of the season, 55 minutes, 40 minutes for that whole process of turning on, downloading all the software, somebody has to do all that during onboarding, that's just not gonna work. Nine minutes per machine, no sweat. And it's done after nine minutes, and I mean done. You turn it on, you do this nine minute image restore, you shut it down, you hand it to the user, and it works out of the box. That's the goal, that's the design. So this involves a lot of hand waving, right? I could just kind of hand wave past how all this actually works. Uh, there's a lot more detail that goes into this. And if anybody wants to know that detail, uh, come find me, come talk to me. I have, po like, I, I posted the GitHub link earlier. Uh, the README I wrote two days ago, it's pretty thorough, I think. It does a pretty good job covering all the bases for your usage. You can use this right now. It requires no setup. I mean, right now you just need to have auto DMG and monkey and you know, copy of server and a deploy studio. It's, it'll just work out of the box for you right now. So if you want to experiment with it, this is a good time to do it. Um, and you know, it's all up on our GitHub page. If you have any questions or problems with it, be sure to yell at Mike. He's a service owner. Um, I'll be hiding in the corner. And uh, I hope that works out for you. So this is all the, I stole everything from Creative Commons. So I have to give attribution. Uh, yes, I will make, we, we can make the slides available for sure. Hello? Hi. How big is your standard image? Uh, it's about 12 gigs now, I think. Yeah, so it's not too bad. So I found that on a Mac Pro, um, the actual image build takes about mm, 20 minutes. Yeah, um, on, on a Mac Mini, it's closer to like 35, 45, depending on the age of the Mac Mini and the speed of the disk. So this is one of the situations where uh, disk speed really is like the number one, number one issue. Mac, uh, auto damage, auto DMG is is threaded, and it does a pretty decent job, you know, as a multiprocess. So really, it's disk speed. It's it has to load up all those packages and run all those installs, and that's just disk speed. So you said that uh, there's no uh, interaction from IT but somebody still has to kick off the image. Yeah, so that all comes from, so we, we, we have a, a facility that does most of the imaging. We have a facility that does most of the imaging ahead of time, so like one place is set up to handle like 120 machines at once, and so they basically do this whole process in large bulk and then ship them out to all the different places that need them. So when the boxes arrive, they just literally pull them off the truck, turn them on, and everybody has shiny new computers. All right, a uh, question from the channel Mind is, uh, if you check some the packages or images on all the remote ser servers doing the image build. Do I? Or what if I do? Do you? So ultimately, it kind of depends. So what I've, what I've discovered is that uh, things like modification date changes are sufficient to trigger checksum differences when you're coming to image building. Um, and so a lot of times, just depending on some factors I can't control, uh, overall image checksum might be different just because a different time was added for a package that was downloaded uh, than on another server. That being said, um, I've finally gotten to the point, thanks to using uh, Joe, Joe Chilcote's uh, uh, V-Fuse. Right, so, <laughs> thanks Joe. Um, using V-Fuse, it's actually really easy to test this out because V-Fuse can build a VM based off of an image you feed it. So you take this image, you pipe it straight into V-Fuse, and now you have a VM you can just turn on and test. You can just turn on and make this and test to see if this image works. So I am now 
like 99.9% .9 confident that the process is going to be identical on every single imaging server. I mean, it really kind of has to be because I'm not doing anything special on any of them. As long as the packages all come from the same source, the result is basically going to end up being the same no matter what I do. So I don't necessarily have to check some. Um, I, and in the few times that I've tried to see if that made a difference, it hasn't. So I just I don't, I don't do that as part of the process. Instead, whenever I make changes, I just do a straight vFuse build into a VM, test, does it look right? Um, I've, you know, I've, I've been meaning to kind of like write a test suite to sort of make sure that all the things we want are actually there. But so far, um, I will say anecdotally at least, that I haven't had any problems doing this. I haven't seen any occurrences of uh, malformed images. Uh, generally, if the process fails, it fails hard, and auto DMG just stops. And we have alerting set up so that looking at the logs, you can tell when an image build just didn't work. And then um, one of the things I hand waved over this is that when you specify the deploy studio repo, it copies the repo automatically, and it also renames the last one that it made. So worst case scenario, your current image is broken, you just rename the old one back and you just swap it. So that way you always have you know, the, one, the most recent one after that as a, as a backup. All right, uh, another question from the channel was, uh, how are you handling bandwidth costs in remote sites? That is a problem I do not have the answer to. That is not my problem. That is someone else's problem. Um, so in, in, in sites that have really limited bandwidth and sites that have really slow internet connections, um, yeah, I, I recently set one up uh, uh, you know, in a pretty, pretty remote, pretty, pretty far off site that only has one person there most of the time. And uh, that they don't, they don't have a connection to the backbone. So that build took almost two hours and most of that was downloading. I mean, it's just, that's just how it is. Um, once you have the downloads done, it caches them locally. So it only has to download new changes that you've made. So you can build the same image every night as long as you don't make any changes. You're not, you're not changing anything else in the process. So it's only those minute updates from day to day that have to be incorporated in. And then uh, one last question before we start taking it from the audience uh, was if you're using the uh, auto damage cache builder that's in the Facebook IT uh, GitHub, is that what you're using? Correct. Yes, right. I just pushed that to master, I think, two days ago. It's, okay. It's, it's, it's good to go. It's the exact same one that we use. We All right. How many um, laptops are you imaging at the same time? You said... It really depends. Um, the facility is set up to handle up at 120 spots at a time. Um, I think realistically, we probably don't do quite that many every week. Um, but I would say, like at any given uh, during during the heaviest times of the year, we're seeing easily like 60 to 100. Um, and that the, the simple way we solve that is just uh, multiple servers, multiple netboot servers. Wow. Okay, Mike Dodge told me the number is a little bit higher than that. <laughs> quite a bit higher than that. Um, so multiple imaging servers on the same subnet. Uh, the nice thing about Netboot is that uh, because it's based on broadcasting, it just picks whoever responds first. And so if you have sufficient number of imaging servers uh, available that are, that are all broadcasting Netboot, the client will just kind of pick out of a hat whichever one it talks to you first. And so you kind of get an even distribution. You kind of get an even distribution randomly uh, just by being able to have all these in the same southern at the same time. So whenever we need to add more scale to it, we can always just spin up another server. Do you do any uh, localization of your images, customization based on parts of the world? So m nearly all of our customization is actually done by Chef. Um, and the first thing that happens uh, is, is the, first time, the, 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 fir the only post restore action we have to worry about is Chef has to run to get the machine set up. And that Chef run is what applies any unique customization we might have for that machine based on any number of factors that we could have, based on who might own it, where it is, things like that. Um, all those things are, are, are done Post outside imaging. of the image. The image is always based off of the US App Store download. Um, and this is fine in most cases. I actually ran into a kind of a weird situation uh, with specifically with French keyboard laptops that use the Azerty keyboard. We found, and I can't reproduce this on demand, but we found a certain, certain situations where uh, they boot up the image, like the, the US App Store image that we've made, and the keyboard doesn't actually work. It has the wrong bindings. It doesn't have QWERTY or Azerty properly. If they plug in an external keyboard, it actually works at that point. And then they can log in, and then it fixes itself. But on first login, for no apparent reason, the localization is just broken. The keyboard input is just completely broken. I have no idea why. And it's only this one set of keyboards. Mystery. So um, with the uh, configuration of auto cache, 
what, what, what do you, what do Auto you DMG cache okay. builder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the configuration of it. Can you exp you you glossed over what mon the monkey portion when you, when you say it's getting monkey? How do you so, define that and what does that actually so mean? So quite literally, what it does is it, it looks at the host machine's monkey configuration. So you know each machine has the preferences that tell it where the server is, what manifest it should use, things like that. With Auto DMG Cache Builder, you feed it the manifests if you want to specify one. It uses the host's monkey preferences to find the server. It looks at the manifest and just looks at the list of things that are managed installed. All it does is say, OK, what is monkey telling me should be installed in this manifest? And it just literally downloads each item locally into its cache. So in that sense, it doesn't use monkey to check. It just looks at what monkey says needs to be there, and it uses that as its guide. So how does uh, DEP and MDM enrollment play into this? It doesn't. Right. At all. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you, if you wanted to do that, you could just add your enrollment profile as uh, you can use. Uh, Tim Sutton has a great make profile package script that runs a prof that uh, when you install it, it will try to install the, the profile if it can. If it's on a, a non booted system, it will put it into a specific folder that Apple treats as a install these profiles on boot. If you put profiles in this folder and you remove the trigger file, Apple, will, when you boot up the machine, will go ahead and install the profiles in there. Um, I don't actually know if that works with enrollment profiles or not. I've never tried. Um, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So maybe somebody can tell me that. But uh, you, basically, I would just add the enrollment as part of the first, the first boot actions. I would either preload that into the image or make sure that the files are already on disk so that some script could run on first boot that then uses these files to engage in the enrollment action. So we don't necessarily do that, but it's really trivial to add that into the process. Um, now, the thing about like DEP and MDM is that uh, in most cases, those are designed to sort of take the place of that first boot action. And so uh, you would want to sort of design your process around you're enrolling machines after they've already been turned on and set up. You're not using the DEP first time enrollment. You're using the enroll in MDM manually method. So you just sort of have to recraft your workflow a little bit to accommodate that. Anyone else? So you said that the software for new hires is cached locally on the machine um, to save for download. Do you, people then delete them afterwards if they don't want Microsoft Office or they don't want uh, Photoshop or they don't want anything so, like that? Um, th so with, with Monkey, when you specify a managed install, Monkey says that must always be installed. And it will keep trying to install it if it's ever removed. Um, so there's a combination of managed installs plus uh, arbitrary packages. So in, in, in our example, Microsoft Office 2016 is an arbitrary package. We don't actually force everyone to install Office. We want it preloaded because we want people to start out having it there, but they always have the chance to come by and remove it later. So things that are managed installs are not removable, but arbitrary things we want to preload for them. Let's say we, if we wanted to, we could preload you know, Photoshop if we, if we were giving them out to a whole bunch of designers. Um, that would save some time, and if they want to, they could go ahead and remove it later. But generally speaking, um, yeah, if it's managed, no, it's not, it's not removable. Um, if it's optional, throw it into your optional package. Throw it into your, your additions list, and then there it is. All right, thank you. So. All right, and uh, Nick, if you have your phone on you, if you can hop in the Mac Brain Slack channel, I'm sure there's all kinds of questions for you. <laughs> kind of pull it up. Showing the mirror on the other side. Oh, it's a.
Go for it. <laughs> Just unplug the HDMI. Developers, you can't. <laughs> no, you're good. Desktop presenter up. Yep. You good? Guess once that we just want to make sure we sync it up. Yeah, make sure that network adapter is allowed. It's not showing an IP address. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. There you go. That's okay. Five. Here, turn off the light. I can't remember here. Yeah. Alright. Still black. I did do that. Not connected. Yeah, so this is actually showing display, not touch. Yeah. So go ahead and add the interface. There you go. Oh. Cancel. Yeah. Thought we had it working. <laughs> oh. Yeah, down there at the bottom. You got it. Great. Check out my IP address now. There we go. Let's close out the network so we don't get our DNS. Look at that shit. That's Not from. And they should your VMs. You know which one it was again? Yeah, I, they're all from. Oh. All right. We're good? All right, um, my name is Charles Heiser. Um, I'm gonna do an into the mic. Is that better? Better, okay. Um, my name is Charles Heiser. Uh, I'm doing an introduction to Mac Patch. A lot of you may have heard just rumblings about it or whatever, looked it up, saw mention here or there. Um, it's an application which I've written for Lawrence Livermore. A um, Little bit about me, um, I've been a software developer at the lab for Oh, 10 years or so. Uh, did IT administration before that and been in the field for probably 25 years or so. Um, let's see. I'll excuse my presentation skills. They're not great. <laughs> um, so let's jump in. What is Mac Patch? Mac Patch is an open source uh, Mac OS X system management tool. Uh, it's designed for essentially patching your machines. Um, software distributions, very similar to Monkey, um, Jamf, Casper, or other solutions out there. Um, so I want to give a little bit of history on this. So I, in the past, I've done a lot of implementations and architectures for a lot of different types of tools out there. So we had a lot of issues at Lawrence Livermore with tools not working up to what we were expecting and not being able to manage or modify to our expectations. Um, we live in kind of a closed environment that, you know, doesn't tend to adapt to the outside world as well as it should. And a lot of that was because of how we, you know, perceived in our environment. Things have changed a lot and have gotten a lot better. So um, basically we had owned a couple of different other products and or purchased them. Uh, we had modified them, made them work for our environment. Things worked well, then they decided to purchase something else another product and it didn't work. And you know, we were kept getting promised uh, something else, another version's gonna fix all of our issues and just never happened. 
Um, so MacPatch originally was written as an interim solution and because we were under a lot of you know, pressure to get our systems patched and users weren't doing it, the other management tools weren't doing it. So that leads for what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, requirements um, to run MacPatch. Uh, what are the kind of, you know, some high level features, what's in it. Uh, we're gonna talk about a little bit the client and how the client works. Um, I'm actually gonna do a server install and configure the server and then install the client and hopefully the demo gods are with us and it'll patch and everything else. So it's all working on a couple of VMs, so. Um, features. So Mac patch, as the name you know, says, initially it, it was originally designed to do patch management, Apple software patches. Nobody was applying their patches in our environment, the Apple ones, so OS versions were out of date, they're all over the place. And you know, people handle that with scripts these days, but you know, we were really in a weird spot. Um, another one of the features is software distribution, and that's a little bit different than patch management. We're able to preload and install software mandatory or make software optional and via software catalog, similar to what some people have seen through Monkey. But you know, what we offer are some other features to software distribution like optional mandatory applications, certain time frames in which applications become mandatory and we'll install it different sets of times. Um, also included with it, we've got inventory and basic reporting so you can run your reports right out of the interface and you know, take a look at your environment. Um, the admin, the client, everything, it's fairly simple to use. You know, the documentation, I gotta say, isn't great. Um, I've been working on it more and more and realizing that it is a big deal. And you know, when you're in the code all the time, it, it's kind of like becomes second, you know, <laughs> plays a backseat, but um, really working on the documentation. Uh, MacPatch is scalable. You know, currently we use it in our environment. You know, it, it manages about, I don't know, 3,300 systems right now. And with only running on a few Mac mini servers, um, a lot of that is being moved over to Linux and I'll talk about that later. Um, it was designed for the Mac. Um, so hopefully easy to use. People know what to do, how to use it. Um, also, it's all built on open source technologies. Um, and that to me was a big deal because I you know, when I rewrote the stuff from the interim solution to what we have now, I really wanted to make it available for everybody to be able to use. Requirements, um, server requirements. Uh, Mac OS 10.9 or higher, um, it, the server does run on Linux. It's been tested on and run on RHEL 7 and Ubuntu 14. I haven't just, I don't use a lot of different flavors of Linux, so it probably can run on other ones, but that's what it's right now set up to be able to compile and run on. Um, minimum of four gigs of RAM, eight is recommended. If you got more, you can scale to a larger amount of clients per, per server. Um, it requires Java, in the future it won't, um, but right now the back end runs off Apache Tomcat, so uh, that's gonna be changing in the future. Disk space is really depends on the number of patches, custom patches that you deploy from your, your environment. Um, right now I think we use up about 300 gigs off of our servers and you know it really starts out kind of small as you start adding more and more patches you know that's where your disk space is going to come from uh, the web admin console requires safari chrome or firefox sorry if you're a windows user or ie breaks and i'm not going to work about work around it um if somebody else wants to that's fine <laughs> uh client right now the client requirements it works with 10.7 and higher um we still have a couple of 10.7 machines, not very many. We've been getting rid of a lot of machines. Um, the Mac patch client. So the client is really comprised of the agent, which is command line based. Um, some of the UI stuff is we have a self patch, um, which shows you what patches you need. We'll install and take care of all of that. Software catalog of any software you know, applications that we put out for the environment that you want to install. A um, couple of the really neat features with the software side of the house is it's really tightly coupled with patching. So therefore you don't have to recreate software installers or redeploy software over and over to the latest versions for machines. So what you do is you create a software task and you attach a patch to it. And basically, so when you install something out of the catalog, you want to call it generic office 2011. You know, I know it's old. Um, and then 
you attach the patches to it. So automatically when it does the install, it automatically patches at that point. So you're not constantly having to manage and maintain your software in your environment. You know, you can basically let it actually manage that and, you know, you, you can keep moving on with your daily work. Um, of course, the, you know, the UI stuff doesn't need any admin rights to do the installs. And um, the client is also self-updating. So, of course, when you push out the client, you know, install it via SSH or however, um, you know, from that point on, it'll manage itself. Demo. All right, I'm going to jump into a server install. So a couple of the prerequisites for Mac patch is MySQL. Um, 5.1 to 5.6, 5.7 does not work at the moment. Uh, MySQL made some changes to the core structure and some of the SQL modes are not supported for some of the queries that go on. Um, so at this time, it's unfortunately not supported. Uh, Java JDK uh, needs to be there. So for the current environment that I'm going to show you, I've actually pre-installed MySQL and set that up because it's out of scope for, you know, doing database administration. Um, and then Java's already installed as well. Uh, so we're going to install Mac patch from the binary distribution and then set up the database and configure and launch the Mac patch services on it. Let's see if we got the, okay, Let's see if we can jump into it. Client server. Enough of the screen. Cool. So, all right. I've preloaded a lot of the software from the GitHub site. So, I'm going to open up the Mac patch binary distribution itself and then just double click on the server. A lot of this is watching progress bars grow. Yes. And. I did with fat finger. So the the total installation time and getting up and running with services and everything else and getting patch content installed is anywhere from depending on your network in connection it's anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes and you're up and running and that's with actually getting third party patches installed as well via auto PKG and auto PKG or so it's actually installed so Right now we're gonna use the terminal and configure the server. So I'm gonna cheat and just use a root shell real quick. So we're gonna, everything for Mac patch is installed into library Mac patch. And then for the server, it's in server. We're gonna go conf scripts setup MP database setup. We just have to set up a couple accounts for the database. Just accepting the defaults is what you want to do. Let's set a password and a read-only account. And then my, and then this asks for the root user. And now I'm going to actually accept the views. All right, database is all set up. The scheme is all installed. Everything's ready to go at that point. So now we're actually going to set up the configuration part for the services. So we're going to run database and LDAP setup. So the first username and password, we're going to change that from the default. So we're going to leave the name and set a password. And then the database is on localhost. Accept the ports, username. The password we just typed in as part of the database setup script, and the same for the read only. We're not going to set up LDAP and Active Directory logins for the users for the admin console at this time because don't have anything here for that to use. Done. And then we start the services. We want to run that with the setup flag. All of this is in the documentation. So MacPatch has two different types of servers. One's a master and the others are distribution servers. The master actually runs the console. The, and basically, depending on the size of your environment, if you add additional distribution servers, those servers are which the clients talk to. They will fail over to the master if for whatever reason they can't talk to the distribution servers. But the master is really there to store copies of the actual software and then distribute that out to the distribution servers. So we're going to say we're a master. We're going to enable the web services, admin console. 
We're not going to start any sync services because, well, we don't have any other servers. And then we're going to load patch content from Apple. Uh, at this moment, to speed. Um, the other thing is Mac patch runs on three different ports, uh, port 8080, port 8443, standard Tomcat ports for SSL, and port 2600. The client communicates on port 2600 for all of its uh, communications. Um, what we're doing, what it sets up is port forwarding for port 80 and 443 to make things easy. Okay. Server is now up and running. Now we're going to do the quick configuration. We'll just go to localhost. By default, it sets up and installs a self-signed certificate. If you're going to run this in a production environment, I highly suggest you go out and go get a certificate for real. All right. MP admin and the password which we set up. No, I'm not going to save it. So the admin console comes up and there's nothing there, no clients, no dashboard information. It's all pretty generic. So the first thing we're actually going to do is we're going to adjust our server settings under Mac patch servers. And by default, it just generates a local host entry, which you're going to want to change. Um, at this time, we could use the IP, but the actual server name we're going to use, I found a bug, and that has to do with certificates being compiled under 1010 and above now with Apple's transport security settings. For whatever reason, it does not like the IP address for doing certificates. So for the purpose of this demo, set up the server. Okay, it's active. And now we want to set up our client configuration. We just have to edit and save because it auto fills some of the settings for the client. And now the server's basically configured and ready to go to upload an agent to it. So deploy an, to deploy an agent, we come under deploy, we download the agent updater, comes on down. This is not self this is not signed, so we're going to have to open it. Do the open. Yes. Here we're going to choose localhost, port 2600, uh, choose the package. The package for the client package is actually in the server under client. And it's just a zip file. And then right now we're not going to sign it. I don't have an identity on here to sign the actual PKG. I do, you know, sign ours. So um, I do recommend others do it too, because by default, Adam's Apple's setup or security settings require signatures for packages. Um, Mac patch supports a plugin architecture as well for inventory and other things. Um, we don't have any plugins to include, so we're just going to upload this guy. There we go. Pretty straightforward. This is all running on a VM, so in an actual on an actual server it goes a lot faster. All right, that's all installed and ready to go. Let's quit out of that. Let's close. Uh oh, I think I suspended. <laughs> uh oh, what I do? virtual machine library, come back to the server. Sorry about that. There's one last thing we want to configure, which is the client. Come back in here. And we'll just refresh the client. And we got to activate the client itself. All right. So the client's been configured. You're actually able to d download it now and install it, do whatever. Um, the next part, we're going to set up an account real quick. And this is for loading content in from auto PKG. Username, PKG. email address we're not going to use. That's for notifications, password.
and specified the user type to be auto PKG and that it's enabled and so essentially now we're fully configured for auto PKG to run and through auto PKG -er and you know upload any content into it in the background Mac patch has been synchronizing Apple content um, it's probably eating up bandwidth but it we're gonna shut it down here in a second anyways I've got another VM already pre-saved with all the content already loaded in on average that takes about you know the the Apple content to sync takes about 15 to 20 minutes it's not actually synchronizing the actual content from Apple um, I'm gonna pause that and jump back over the slides. It's not actually synchronizing the content from Apple directly. It's only synchronizing all of the information regarding the packages, basically the, the, the plist information. You're going to use either Reposado or something else to, to, you know, to clone all the Apple content, either locally for yourself, or you can actually just have it reference Apple directly, each of the clients for the software catalogs. Uh, I jumped ahead. So we jumped through the server configurations. We've done the agent upload. Um, and everything is pretty much done and up and running. Actually, did I jump through that? So I'm going to jump into the content since we got everything all loaded and set up. And for that, we jump back over. And we're going to actually say ready for patch group config. Don't save the server. miracles of VMs. All right. So we've now got all of our content loaded in. And did I use the same password? No. Uh-oh. Demo gods don't like me. It's weird. Should exist unless the database isn't running. Answer. MP. Okay. Well, that's not very helpful. Well, the demo gods are not with me. <laughs> um, I wish. Where's, did I lose the mouse? Arg! VMware's killed me. Sorry about that. So, <laughs> what you would do is once you basically get into the actual server environment um, without VMware dying, um, you would create a patch group, which is already defined for you. It's called default. Your patches would show in there for you have custom patches. Oh, good. Um, hopefully we get up and running. So you've got custom patches, and then you've got Apple patches. You have to change your state from, from create is their initial state when content gets loaded up and in. Their state is set to create. You got to switch that to QA for testing. Then you can switch it all over to production to push out. Just a second. Um, once that's been put in there, then you go into your patch group, and inside your patch group, you're going to add your additional your packages essentially to that patch group. The client is now available to actually patch whatever comes down from that, whatever it finds and it scans as initially being available. I wish I could show more. Hopefully, we can get this up. You want me to take questions real quick, and then if this is back up, we can talk some more, and then <laughs> might make it easy. So, so based on what I, I, I think you just said, um, you have to, on your server, uh, assign patches to any given client? You assign it to a group, and the client is automatically configured to talk to a group. Okay. Is, is there a way to just say all Apple patches? Yeah, you can basically mm -hmm. select all the Apple patches and just 
Go. I mean, uh, dynamically. From from here on, I want all Mac patches, or sorry, all Apple patches automatically to go to this one group. Usually, we, we in the past, we've never actually set that up that way you, because the a client only belongs to one patch group. So therefore, you're adjusting your patches based on or not, it becomes a of too many different types of patch groups, maybe one for laptops, maybe one for desktops, and that's about it and your laptop ones, maybe you're not applying as many of the firmware patches and other things, because those people could be on travel. Let's see if we can get in. Go for it. And... Ah! We're in. Cool. Patches? Apple patches. So that's everything that it, you know, engulfed from Apple. Everything's in a create patch state. Here I'm just gonna, got a quick and easy button. Switch everything to QA. And for right now, I'm gonna switch everything to production, just for presentation wise. And for instance, you know, iTunes, I'm gonna turn that one off and just disable those patches real quick. Disable, so that's as easy as disabling goes. Custom patches, we can see what actually came from Auto PKGer. So we grabbed a few of the packages that are in Auto PKGer as part of the re recipes. Um, all of these guys are state is set to Auto PKG, so you knew where the package came from and not just create. So we're just going to choose production on these. Enter, and that's fine into our patch group then. This is our patch group. So all the patches will now show up in the patch group. As part of being a, con a production patch group, only production patches will actually show up in here. So if you have a QA group, only the QA patches show up in that. Once they go to production, they'll be available for you to add to your group. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna select everything. This takes a moment because it caches everything in the database so that the actual scan list and the patch list that gets dropped down on the client don't have to generate on the fly. It's a lot quicker this way. And then we're going to save it. And now we've got a patch group already all set up with our patches themselves. Um, now for a client, let's see if we can fire up a client real quick and do the install. I have that guy running. Should have left it running. Come on. All right. So now we will go to assuming nothing has changed. Oh, that's what happened. <laughs> okay. Um, what was the name? space maybe the networks aren't talking to each other no that's right Demo gods are not with me. All right. Anyways, that, that's, the, that's the gist of it. You would install the client, run self-patch. Actually, I can do, yeah. Actually, let's install it on the server here directly. And that'll make, you can actually see everything right from here. Okay. The agent P list. Defaults. Yep. 
And locals Mac. That should have worked. I'm not going to kill too much time with it. That's bizarre. Yeah. So, let's see here. Huh? Sorry, you're going to need the box so I can hear. <laughs> Go for it. The box of truth. Go for it. Will this tell if I lie or something? Or something? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> there we go. Testing. Testing. Yes. One, two, three. Awesome. Um, so it runs the patches in root, so it has to, so that it... The Otherwise, agent, you're going to have to... The agent it. runs as root, and the client has a privileged helper tool, so it automatically is elevated to run whatever tasks it needs to um, when it's in the UI interface. Okay, and um, does it matter uh, the... Um, for instance, you know, what gets installed first? Because you know, it may need, for instance, one thing to be done before, let's say, a security patch, or it doesn't matter. I mean, does it actually, does so this when software it comes, actually pick what should be installed first so that that yes, way? Yes, it does. Okay. Yes, it does. So basically, custom patches, they can basically be installed. There's prerequisites that you can assign to a patch. Yeah. Um, to Apple patches themselves, Apple software update engine handles everything under the covers. So therefore, it's automatically doing the required orders for all of the software installs. So I just piggyback off of that and let it do the actual determination of you know, what order it needs to install in. The, um, but the custom patches themselves, those can be installed in any order, but you can exactly. assign requisites to them, like prerequisites and postrequisites. Okay, and also, um, for instance, there's a group that I know that likes to, let's say patches were gonna run every Friday or something, yep. after 5 p.m., once a month, whatever. Um, but a large portion of this group likes to keep a lot of windows open with, with let's say, files and documents. Isn't it going to just force the patches on there and then reboot and then basically just close out those that's, files? That's a great question. So essentially what happens is it will install any packages that don't require a reboot in the background. Um, it's up to you to, to determine that. Like Microsoft, for instance, Office, we make it a reboot patch. So it installs because we don't want anybody to lose their user data or anything else because Microsoft likes to say, hey, let's quit everything so that we can actually apply everything. So we've made Office a reboot patch. So basically, it pops a notification across the top of the screen and says, hey, look, you've got five patches that need reboot. And then when you hit restart, there's a launch agent a uh, privilege helps oh. okay. <laughs> All right. Here. Um, two questions. One, if you have a def deferral policy, how do you ensure that it's not deferred indefinitely? And then two, can you also touch on the software distribution aspect or how that's managed? Built into it as of today, all the time and you know while that that was really helpful you know people were like god you know it, it to me I knew there was a better way and using user notifications I thought was a better way of doing it so it just pops there and it's a reminder knowing what you've got to do um, in our environment we basically block people's network access if they haven't patched within a certain amount of days so once we release patches you have seven days to patch if you don't you go into a block state so therefore, you can have internal network access, but not external network access. And then after another certain amount of days, you get kicked off the network altogether. So we're leveraging that technology as of right now. Second one, software. So software distribution itself. Sorry, you're going to have to repeat the question. Okay, software, software is basically assigned to the machine and it has criteria associated for which OS, what you know, certain pieces can go with it. And it's assigned to a software catalog 
and that catalog will get displayed onto a user's machine. So we don't install like a lot of like Photoshop and other things. If we do, we put it in there and the user's got a serial number so they can install software, but if they don't have a serial number for it, it's, they're just eating up disk space. So, okay. yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, you said you had about 3,000 uh, nodes and what does your team look like and what is it, uh, what is um, Mac patch uh, in it's terms me? of management need? Me as a developer uh -huh. and partial support. And George over here actually does all of the day-to-day -day just little bits of, you know, when people say, oh, it's Mac Patch's fault. Turns out it's an end user fault more than 99. I do a good, yes, I do have bugs. And yes, I do fix them. And yes, you know, I will take blame when it's my turn. Um, but, you know, honestly, it's just two of us and, you know, for the most part, it, there's very little care and feeding when it's up and running. And not in a VM right here. <laughs> so if there's a zero day uh, patch that you need to get out and you need to get it out within maybe 48 hours, how would Mac patch be able to handle that? So we would make that a reboot patch. Um, one of the ways we would address it is either there's certain criteria types that can be associated. Um, and we'd end up making it more of a script. So when that script actually does a scan on the box, it can actually kick off a patch install at that point. Um, in the next iteration of Mac patch, that has been one of the things that I've wanted to address. And actually there will be a critical software group, which is a patch group, which is a little bit different, where those patches will be installed every day that gets checked. And when those get dropped into there as being critical patches, those will automatically get installed. There's no user options. And it'll pop up and tell you you got to reboot if there's a reboot associated for zero days. So, Do you handle uh, like hardware-specific Apple updates? Like I saw there was a Bluetooth 2012 MacBook 12-inch update up there. Are you going to apply that to all machines, or is it So it'll like only apply to machines where it's actually applicable. Okay. So while we add it to the group, if you know software update runs on the box and says, hey, look, that patch is not needed, it's not going to run it. So in the past, we, we ourselves didn't apply firmware updates because it required a user. This is four years ago. Um, without any issue. So it, it, it'll apply to whatever is necessary. So. <laughs> Not a football player. Um, so these 3,300 endpoints, the clients, um, what's your distribution like? Are they all in one LAN or are they distributed around the country, the world? So we're all in one geographic location, but we have, you know, laptops that are roaming, you know, constantly. And, you know, there is a part of Mac patch called the proxy server, which I didn't talk about here which allows you, so if you've got a firewall in place, it allows you to broker all your requests and it keeps a cache of it out there on your DMZ so that it'll actually patch while it's out and about so you don't have to VPN in and take care of all of that. So, but yeah, everything for us is all geographically, you know, co-located essentially. Uh, so if, if you have uh, a group of computers that need to be in the, like the critical group that you were talking about and they also need to be in like the, the science group or the engineer group or something, do you, can you nest one group inside of another or do they have to be in one Not or the other? Not at this time, no. Okay. It, it, the, the security patch group that I was thinking of, it will actually be a separate entity all in itself. Because those, those are the kind of things. So if you defer patches and defer patches, you don't want to defer a zero day. So those would automatically get dropped into a critical group and those would automatically get applied. That, that's my thought behind it. It's all HTTP based, all REST, full web services. What package types do you support? Sorry, over here. Sorry, go ahead. Do you, do you support uh, images and packages? Does everything have to be repackaged to a package or? So the primary for patches, for custom patches themselves, are all PKG based. Um, so that is changing because software distribution right now supports .app, .you know, script, .dmg with the app, 
Um, there's zip with PKG, just PKG. So it supports the wide gamut under software distribution. That part just hasn't been merged in for patches at this time. So the way our auto PKG stuff will automatically package up like Firefox and everything else um, into a PKG so that's deployable as a patch. Have you played at all with uh, using Docker to make the setup a little bit smoother? What we've done, no. George, George, sorry, <laughs> we've played with Docker a little bit, but actually George had set up a Vagrant environment for doing all the testing and everything else, and that was our path. But as we've gotten to binary distribution and other things for at least the Mac side right now, um, we found it super easy to just get things up and running that way and not needing Docker at this time to, to do it. Um, cool. At some point, it would be nice to get more of that configuration in there, but cycles. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about how it integrates with uh, Auto Package? I know that obviously Auto Packager has the built-in integration, but like, what does that workflow look like from an administrator's point of view? How does the software actually get in and get scoped to the computers? So the way, the way it works itself is we've got the recipes. Um, George had written the uh, Python importer, I guess it is, for auto PKG. So you do your additions and you add the receipts and up it goes. It's pretty straightforward and pretty easy to do, honestly. Uh, no, see what you saw right there when we were actually showing you in the server interface itself and admin console. They're, they're in the custom patches themselves and it had a type of auto PKG and now they would get added to your patch group. You've got to, autom you've got to add them to the patch group because by default, they're not enabled. They're in an auto PKG set, which is like a create state for you to go verify if there's anything you want to tweak regarding it, you'd have to go do that at that point in time and then add it to the group. Yeah. All right. Real quick, do we have anything in the uh, the chat? Any questions? Oh. <laughs> We're running out of time here. Sorry. No. All right. Cool. You mentioned something about email notifications. Uh, what kind of notifications does it support, and what can it send out? So the email notifications, primarily for like Auto PKG, it, it sends out saying, "Hey, a new one's been uploaded," because we use Auto PKG or and set it on a schedule. So when we create new, like Google Chrome comes out, it, its parent recipe itself gets updated, it runs its schedule and automatically get a notification that, hey, look, there's, another, there's a new Google Co Chrome release in there. And that way you can go take a look or there's a new Firefox release, there's a new you know, Flash release, like there's never no, one of those. <laughs> so, those get no, so therefore you know to go do something at that point, that's the notification for that piece of it. One more question. Anybody? Nope. All right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. This is all working ahead of time. <laughs> it's the demo gods. Uh, it's the demo gods. I almost did a video just to show, just in case. <laughs> all right. Well, everybody, Go thank you it. for coming. And uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs> need to get out of here within the next 15, 20 minutes, all right? Thanks. <laughs>